good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Um, glad to present you today um, uh, the introduction to cybersecurity information sharing. Um, so we are two uh, today, so Sami and myself um, we will uh, do the presentations for today. Um, just one, some of, of logistic aspect. Don't hesitate to ask questions during the chat. Uh, we don't mind to uh, answer live questions uh, and to uh, basically even divert if needed uh, during the presentations. So first of all, I will do a presentation regarding the introduction of MISP and information sharing. Um, so for the ones that are new uh, to MISP, uh, so I guess they, they know how we work and how the project is working and so on. Uh, and then later uh, today, we will uh, go into deeper into how MISP is working, uh, all the user aspects of it, and how to use it. Uh, so with a practical example. So that's the agenda of today. You have seen in the chat uh, room, there is a HDOC uh, document that, uh, which is basically shared containing all the details. Uh, all the slides are publicly available. Uh, we will record the session today. Uh, so like that you can uh, uh, share it with colleagues and so on. Uh, you can take notes, you can share whatever you like. Uh, everything that uh, we are talking about is TLP white here. Uh, so uh, don't hesitate to uh, share and uh, redistribute to your um, colleague. So first of all, um, as a MISP project is more a kind of long-term project, the project has uh, no more than 10 years, um, I, I will go a bit back into the history of, and what we have done over there. Um, so the thing is, uh, MISP started from, I would say, uh, edge cases. Um, so MISP started as a kind of, of project uh, for CSIRT, so for CERTs, for incident response team um, that need uh, capabilities to share information, structure information um, in 2012. So it's a long time ago. Um, at that time, uh, it was mainly malware discussions and malware uh, information that we were sharing. And that's why the old names, which was malware information sharing platforms, which is not anymore used nowadays, it's just MISP, threat sharing uh, platforms, um, which is um, basically where everything started. Um, and that's all the development of MISP has been done over the past uh, 10 years is really based on practical use case, on practical usage. Um, we don't have like crazy plans for the next 10 years. We have like practical plans to make things work um, with a strong focus on uh, avoiding duplication of work. And that's really <clears throat> what it started uh, for MISP. Uh, we basically designed the tool to avoid that two team, like two thirds, were uh, basically working on their own, on their own on a specific uh, cases without knowing that the other are working on it. And that's where everything started with MISP. Um, we had this uh, regular meeting between uh, multiple uh, CERT in the Benelux region. And what we discovered is um, that we were working basically on the same case, uh, but we didn't know that. Uh, so we were basically wasting like one or two months uh, before we had those kind of regular meetings uh, to share this information. So that's why. We came with this idea of, 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 uh, of platforms, and the first version of the platform was done by Christophe Van de Pla, which was cool at that time, uh, side of six. And he basically started the first versions of the platforms. And later on, this platform became MISP, uh, which is nowadays the same project, an open source project, uh, and it's really based on the feedback of the, of the users. I will come back later on that, and I think it's an important point, is how we develop the platforms and how we plan even on the next week, months, the developments based on user feedback and practical use case. So it's really a community-driven dri uh, community development. Uh, today, we have you on board for this, uh, um, either two days or even the three days, uh, training sessions. Um, so if you have any feedbacks, ideas, bug reports, and so on, feel free um, to, uh, to share with us. It's really important because it's really based on, on what um, uh, uh, model of MISP is, is, is basically designed. Just a bit of background about us, um, Sami and I, uh, we are working for Circle. Uh, Circle is uh, the cert for the private sector in Luxembourg. Um, we are uh, working on incident response, but next to that, we do a lot of tooling, open source tools that are used to support incident responders, security operation centers, and ISACs and so on. So that's what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And MISP, uh, the development of MISP is led by us, by Circle. Uh, even if the core team is mixed with different organizations. So Circle is just one of the one leadings, but behind you have multiple organizations in different sector of activities, uh, security operations, intelligence, militaries, uh, private companies, uh, financial sectors, national certs, law enforcement agencies, and so on. So 
basically the contributors of MIST are all the users that are regularly contributing feedbacks, updates, and so on on, on MIST. Uh, something that is important terminology-wise, um, MIST is a software. Then when you run a MIST software, you run a MIST community. Um, so everyone running their own MIST are starting a MIST community. That's quite important. Um, and as Circle, we operate those uh, different communities. Um, I will come back on that today too, uh, because this is really the core uh, part of MISP. MISP is not only the tool set, but it's uh, functionalities, uh, policies, data model, knowledge base, and so on that are used to create um, trade intelligence platforms for specific communities. Could be single team, could be an organization, could be inter-organizations, inter-countries, or even larger than that. Um, some of the project is funded through the European Commission. So we get funding from or uh, uh, from Circle, we get funding through the uh, European programs too, uh, from the Connecting Europe facilities, and we get funding through uh, par private partnership with other partners too. So what is MISP? And that's, I think, quite interesting to, to see how we stand with MISP nowadays. Uh, over, over the period of time, I mean, MISP evolved into a, a complete solution, which is even a bit even further than the trade intelligence platforms. Really, our, our core focus is really a trade information sharing platforms. Um, the main aspect of MISP and everything we do in MISP is free and open source software. Uh, for us, it's a critical aspect. Um, we don't want to depend on software that might change the license, that might divert, send their models, and so on. We want to be sure that MISP remains an open source software, that uh, everyone can audit it, review it, and so on. Um, under uh, acceptable licenses, open source licenses, and so on, making this uh, a platform that people can use on the long term. And that's really what we want with MISP. Um, for the pan past 10 years, we are doing that. I mean, contributors, for example, are inherently part of the project. So every time a contributor is contributing a software there, he's part and he's co authors of the software. So it's really important for us. MISP is a trade information sharing platform and that is open source and must remain open source. One of the first objectives of MIST is basically to collect information. And those kind of collections could come from various places. It could come from incident response. So when you do an incident response, you get an incident, you collect a lot of evidences, technical information, things like that. So you ingest that into MISP. But it could come from uh, public information, for example, a report from private report that you might receive. Uh, it might come from your analysts that have specific analysis that they are performing. Uh, and MISP is one way to collect and structure that information into one place. Another thing is different tool sets can collect information to MISP. You have a plethora of tools on the internet that are basically using MISP as a way to feed the systems. Uh, I can mention tons of them from the tools web page on MISP project. We have a, a list of those tools, but I mean the major security tools nowadays or OSIN tools have MISP connectors. If they don't, ask them, I'm sure they will be glad to do the support. If you don't know how to do it and so on, just get in touch with us. And sometimes we, we uh, look into some specific tooling and we can do the connections. It's a way to collect feeds to many providers, free provider, open provider, or even proprietary vendors are providing feeds in the MIS format, which is a standardized format to feed into the system. So the, really the first goal of, of collecting this information in MISP is to structure it, have it in the systems, in a central place where all your uh, team, tools, and so on can access the systems. Obviously, when doing so, you want to be able to normalize information, um, detect false positive. Uh, you want to correlate this information. That's really one of the key elements of MISP. Every time that new information is, is ingested into MISP, it starts to be correlated. Um, so for example, if Sami is working on a case, uh, I'm importing a new case, and uh, I discover that basically it's correlating with an existing event from Sami, I can find back that it did work on, on a similar cases and we can start to uh, basically maybe work together or even do kind of competitive analysis of what has been done there. So the correlation aspect is super important on the day to day works. It's a way to save time and to be able to um, do your analysis uh, as quick as possible while having all the information at hand. Another thing that's important too is enrichment of data. Uh, we have an extensive system called the MIS modules where you can enrich the data. And the capability there is really important because a lot of, of information that you receive, you want to uh, enrich it for validations, for having uh, more information to pivot out of it and so on. And you have plenty of ways to do it. Uh, so for example, if you want to query passive DNS services, uh, other vendors that have uh, API and so on, you can just do queries and so on. It's integrated automatically into, uh, into MISP. 
obviously the way when you start with this, such kind of information is to allow teams, organizations, and so on to collaborate. And that's really one of the core aspects of MISP is to be able, for example, to share these tools, uh, this information with other partners, having MISP together. Uh, for example, in ISAAC, for example, you want to share with your partners uh, information, you want to collaborate, the people want to add some information into, uh, into your event and so on. Um, today, we will see in the presentations and in the detail of MISP that you have plenty of way to do collaboration and active collaboration in MISP. Um, but it's really one of the core aspects, uh, for example, uh, pulling, pushing data from two different MISP instances is super easy, uh, but you can start to create really your own communities and define your own rules of how you share information and how you do the collaborations. And obviously, when you have such kind of information, it's not only used by the teams and the analysts and so on, but it's used by tools too, because you can feed uh, and give information to other tools for uh, detections, defenses, purposes, and so on, directly from one of your MISP instances and feed automatically. There's an extensive API. I think on Thursday we have, or on Thursday Wednesday we have a complete sessions regarding API access. I think it's more on Thursday. Um, uh, we we have uh, API, we have libraries and so on, um, and that's really the thing that you want to automate your pipelining into your uh, into your companies organizations. Uh, you can quickly do it in MISP. Uh, we have a complete uh, work, uh, model with that. Uh, we'll talk about all the different features to support that, including workflow that are uh, pretty new features uh, that will be uh, discussed today and the next days uh, too during the sessions. So the development of MISP have evolved over time uh, because the, on, the goal of MISP is to support people and organizations. Initially, we started with very, I would say, specific use cases. Um, in, in this case, it was more, for example, um, initially in, in 2012, um, malware reverser and so on, people doing it in on response. But over the time, where information were starting to be more diverse, uh, more details, that you have more context around it, it become more interesting for a lot of other organizations and other kind of use cases. And we have seen over time an evolution of the use cases of MISP, not only security analysts, but for example, uh, financial fraud analysts were starting to use MISP to, to share this information there. We'll go back to that, but we have a very flexible data model in MISP, which can basically describe anything you like. For example, we, we have seen a lot of, of use cases of, of people using MISP uh, for uh, uh, monitoring disinformation campaigns, for example, because they were able in MISP to describe all those social network activities in an easy way and even to model their own um, uh, data model for their specific use case. And that's really how MISP evolved to have kind of generic tools that people can, you know, customize uh, while keeping the compatibility between those MISP instances, which is, I think, quite important for us on uh, the long term. As a lot of information are in MISP, it's not only the information itself that is interesting, but a lot of people are using MISP for um, doing, for example, trade reports, um, statistical analysis, uh, risk analysis, uh, things, and so on. And it's becoming a kind of sources of practical information that you can use for um, deciding on cybersecurity um, uh, decision and so on. So what is the model of development of MISP? And I think this one is quite important because it's really how we work. Maybe some of you want to collaborate with us in the futures and you can see where you can fit there and how you can collaborate and, and work with us. So how do we work? Um, we basically have um, a kind of internal list of MISP features and future development that we are working on. But isn't it, this is not coming from nowhere. It's coming from direct feedback. And how do we collect that feedback? is through different means. One of the most common means, and that's usually the thing that uh, uh, scared a lot of people when they first connect to our MISP uh, repository, is the GitHub issues. So the GitHub issues for us is a way to track down features, functionalities that uh, people and organizations want, want to have in MISP. Um, they create an issue, they say that they want the features and so on. And the idea being is the following. We can track down over the time the request of features. For example, the workflow functionalities was something that we had as a feature request for some, some years, but not that much. And over the time for the past two, two years, for example, we get more and more requests and it makes much more sense nowadays to have it internally in a uh, side MISP. And that's coming from this kind of feedback that they receive from the users. And one way of getting it is GitHub issues. Another way, um, this one is, is if you want to provide quick feedback, you have a quick question and so on. We have a, a different matrix room that are running on Gitter. You can connect with any matrix client 
or with a Gitter interface, and you can collaborate with us and ask questions and so on. That's one way of, of basically pushing feedback is a two-way mechanism. Um, could be, for example, even bug reports sometimes. It could be other things, but it's really one way of, of getting information there. Another way to do it is obviously trainings like we do today. Um, so we do around, I would say, 20 public trainings uh, uh, on a yearly basis um, where we collect information, idea, and so on. So don't be shy today. For example, if you have a thing, idea, things like that, if you already use MISP and you say, okay, I'm missing something, you want to share about models, use cases, and so on, that's the way to go. And, and the trainings are for us a huge and interesting input for improvement of the MISP platforms. Another thing that we are doing too, um, there are a lot of user groups of MISP worldwide in different countries. Uh, we, we don't control any of those. They are up to the, I would say, local users of MIST that are deciding to, to have their own, own rules and so on. But we do uh, trainings or presentation over there, uh, talking about the recent feature that we introduced and so on. And for us, it's a nice way to get feedback from those uh, user groups uh, that are actually using MISP on a day-to-day -day basis and, and I encode their problems, have some idea of integration and so on. That's another, another interesting way of getting uh, feedbacks. Uh, another thing is we do a yearly summit. Um, this summit was initially called MIS Summit, but now it's a CTI summit. Um, so if you are interested, we do one in, in October uh, in Luxembourg, cti-summit.org. Um, this one is really a way for uh, people that are actively using MISP to show off what uh, they are doing. And usually what you have, you have large organizations, uh, security vendors and so on that are integrating MISP in their pipelining and show to everyone how it, it does. So it's really uh, how they do it. Uh, it's really a, uh, an actual uh, conference, technical conference, where people are sharing uh, practice, uh, technical things and use case in MISP, but obviously general practices on uh, cyber threat intelligence uh, coming from evaluations, methodologies, and so on. And so that's really a nice nice place for, for, for discussing with, with different groups and so on. Another way that we collect information, we, we addition to that, we, we provide professional services from organizations that need to have support contract and so on. And for us, it's a very nice way to get feedback and, and not only bug reports, but really idea of expanding uh, and extending uh, MISP. But besides that, we have kind of 20% of, of uh, things that are I would say more flexible uh, for within the core team uh, of this project. We basically have contributors there that are or people that are actively contributing to MISP or security researcher or researcher in the academic world. And by working with them, we are able to figure out new techniques and so on. So for example, we, we, um, we had this decaying model in MISP and it's not coming from nowhere. It was back and forth discussions with various organizations, uh, even in the academic world, about how to do it practically. Uh, so we always try to translate what um, some uh, researchers are, are basically modelizing and so on, and to see if we can integrate into MISP. And we do tests. So we develop, see if, see if it works. If it works, we incorporate it in the official release of MISP. If it's not, it's a side project, or it's something that we discard at a later stage. So that's a model of governance of MISP. Uh, it's, it's really bound to, I would say, a, a, a model like the Linux kernel, where uh, it's really focusing on the future aspect, and then you have subgroup of people working on specific cases and so on. Um, and we'll see later, it's not only the software itself, but it's a large set of, of knowledge base and so on that we are maintaining to as a, as a MISP project. So just, I think this one is a kind of kind of recall or reminder regarding the different objective when, when people are sharing information. And I think this one is important um, because it's somehow binding the tools to uh, the practices. Um, you see that people might use this for sharing information that they expect the other users will use it for detections. But it's not always the case. Um, you might share information that you see, okay, my use case is detections, but you have other people that are just getting the data and using it to block systems or to block uh, network connectivity, uh, push into an uh, endpoint protection device and so on. And that's really important because depending on how you produce information, this has, might be a different impact on how organizations are using the data. So we have in MISP various features and so on to describe that. Uh, is it used for detection? Is it used for blocking and so on? But that's super important to keep that in mind when you use MISP that when you share on the platforms, you might have different mindsets or different use cases of 
what organization will do with your data that you share. And usually you have three groups, the detection group, the blog group, or the one that are just doing, for example, intelligence or at least analysis on the data. So those three groups might have different objectives. For example, false positive might have a completely different impact on each of those groups. Uh, so keep that in mind. Um, and those can be conflicting. That's fine. Uh, and that's why we try to have all those kind of layer of filtering, detection, and so on. Mis like the warning list, it's a, it's a good example of, of thing that people can detect automatically seeing that it's maybe a false positive, but sometimes people just want to have this kind of information to see the quality of a source, uh, to see if the false positive rate is increasing or decreasing there. So keep that in mind. Uh, it's important for when you are a misuser that you might hit uh, those different kind of, of groups. So what, what, who are the people in organization using MISP? There are many. Um, I will not make a complete list of all organizations that we know about, and I'm sure that um, I will miss some. But we can categorize in different kind of MISP users. Um, as Circle, for example, we operate uh, multiple MISP instances. We have one, a pretty large one, where we have close, I think, to 1,500 organizations nowadays, um, where we have a lot of users, uh, but you might have very different specific uh, MIS communities. Uh, we know about, for example, specific trusted group operating their own MISP instances. And sometimes they are completely in line island mode. So they use the software for their own use case and don't connect to anyone. That's perfect too. It's one way of doing it. Some people are partially connecting. They want to feed their system with all the public information they could get uh, without contributing back. That's fine too. Or some people just want to share activities information. So Keep that in mind, MISP has not a bond model for sharing information. It's really the operator and the administrator of the MISP instance that decide how and how the sharing will be uh, conducted. Um, tomorrow, we have more uh, details, uh, trainings about administrations, um, information sharing, synchronization, and things like that. And this is quite important because it's, you'll see that you have really different use cases and the tools have a plethora of functionalities and so on. Um, so if you go to the settings of MIS, you'll see that you have uh, plenty of settings, but a lot of settings that you don't really care about is just depending on the community that you are in that you want to enable a specific features. And then you have a lot of, of MIS users that are in different sectors of activities, Isaac and so on, uh, for example, financial sector that are um, actively using MIS. Uh, I know some financial sector activities that are uh, sharing structured information, but unstructured information as reported in Markdown into MISP. Uh, we will show that today too, that you can express in MISP in a structured way, but in an unstructured way too, and you can even mix both. Uh, and then you have communities that are more on, on topic basis. You have sometimes that are people setting up a MISP instance for a, a very specific topic. Uh, for example, there is a COVID-19 MISP, which is like focusing on COVID-19. I've seen MISP, for example, for disinformation, um, some that are just, for example, tracking a specific group and just putting that in one MISP instance. So you see that you have a vast variety of, of different use cases. You have different communities. In MISP itself, you can see some of the public communities and you can even ask those communities automatically to join one of their communities, but we don't know all of them. Uh, so sometimes on the website, you have a list of the different communities. Maybe Sami will share it in the chat uh, with the different communities. Uh, it, this one is interesting because you can, you can see that you have different use cases and so on. Uh, for some, it's restricted access, depending if you are members and so on. For some, it's like more open, uh, depending of, of the access. So the communities are large. Uh, so don't always think that MISP is a single way of, of doing things. It's really depending on the organi organization uh, um, uh, operating it. Uh, obviously, uh, military organizations might be uh, very different on, on operating a MISP instance than an NGO using MISP for sharing information about, I don't know, specific political things. So you'll see that might be quite different. So thing that you have to keep in mind too with MISP, um, uh, it's just a tool. Um, so obviously the main problems when you start to share information are not exactly coming from the tool itself, but they are coming from the regulation aspect uh, and the social aspect on uh, your communities and how you work. Because it's basically at the end generating uh, the trust uh, that you have within that community and people are, are either sharing or not sharing information due to that. Um, and then for us as MISP project, we try to, I would say, uh, lean and facilitate such kind of things. Um, and to do so, we have 
uh, web pages on, on this project called compliance, where we already pre-publish documents that might support you, for example, if you are uh, uh, working in the security operation center and uh, you have to um, discuss about sharing with the third parties, uh, but you need to approach your lawyers or legal advisor about it. We have already document in the MIS project talking about that. Um, for example, in the compliance document, we have one for GDPR. It's one of the most recurring questions that we have, but there everything is mentioned. Where is the data controller? Where is the data processor? Things like that. Um, and it's giving you already kind of, you know, easy uh, step to uh, discuss with organization and so on on the legal basis because this document has been reviewed by lawyers. Uh, so it's describing exactly the scope of the use. So the legal restriction itself um, can be overcome by uh, looking at the compliance document that we, we, we have uh, and then maybe dig more into the subject if you, if you need. Obviously, for the practical restrictions, sometimes it's a problem of format, sometimes it's a problem of classification and so on. We try to solve all those kind of problems in MISP itself. Um, so, for example, the, the way of sharing information that we'll talk about later, but there's no one way to share information. It's not the only the information itself that you want to share. Sometimes you just want to share that you have seen the information, what we call sightings. Um, so, those kind of restrictions, uh, MISP is coming with a uh, uh, I would say a nice set of features for that. Um, and that's one way to, I would say, overcome such kind of restrictions. For example, we have data model and, and model of classification that are depending of each organization. And as you said, as I said, for the military one, for example, you have already plenty of classifications. For the non-military one, you have plenty of classifications. In MISC, we support all of those kind of models. Um, so you can find a taxonomy that are describing your classification models and so on. Um, that's one way of, of basically supporting different use cases. And the thing that we try to do too is to be as agnostic as possible regarding the format uh, for the reason being is formats are evolving over time. Uh, things might change, use cases might change and so on. So for us, and that's really important, MISP itself is just a, a transport mechanism to share information. If you want to share information about a specific topic and structure, you must not change your way of working, but it's more that you uh, extend the MIS model to support your way of working. And that's really important for us, for this kind of data models and so on. And I think just later, uh, after my presentation, Sammy will go into more into the data modeling. Uh, and you, like that, you can see how you can represent data in a kind of unique way in MISP uh, to find the different way of doing it. So now if we talk about the MISP project, so initially I started with this history. Uh, so it's more than 10 years that we started the project. Uh, it was in 2012. Uh, initially, it was like a kind of small project with a small GitHub repositories. Uh, nowadays, it's on a GitHub. We are an organization with more, I would say, more than 60 repositories. Um, it's, it's pretty large. And we have, I would say, four main branches in the project. And contributors are contributing in some different branches. And that's to ease the contribution. So if you become a contributor to MISP, it's not only on the aspect of software engineering, software development, and so on, but it could be data modeling, classifications. It could be into uh, um, reporting documents, OS in feeds, uh, specific development, and so on. That are uh, usually this kind of thing. So the contribution in MISP, we can say that half, half, some are more software, but half of the um, other contribution are coming more on the um, different models uh, and, and knowledge base. So <clears throat> obviously, the, the core aspect is the open source software. So MISP has a core software, which is a, um, a software stack running, I would say, pretty standard software stack. We, we are not bleeding edge software stack, but we want to keep a kind of stability there on, on software that are um, reliable on the long terms. And we don't need crazy uh, um, uh, infrastructure to run the software. So you can bootstrap a, a MISP in a virtual machine and start to test with it and so on uh, quickly. And if you want to have a MISP that is scaling for I don't know, half a billion of indicators and information and so on, you can do it. We know users that are uh, storing millions and even billions of indicators in their uh, custom MISP installations. So the MISP core software is really the, the core aspect, data storage, API, and so on, user interface. Then we have extensions. Um, we will talk about it. It's what we call MISP modules. Is extension services and expansion services uh, and import export too. Uh, no, it's even part of the workflow. You can even control the way that the workflow is working 
through uh, external uh, MISP modules. We also maintain a Python library called PyMISP, which is basically a kind of uh, simplified use of the API of MISP. So MISP has a REST API, which is uh, documented as Open API. It's pretty large, uh, but if you want uh, to use uh, Python's, make quick script and so on, PyMISP is helping you to, to make it easier and so on. And then you have plenty of other software we just mentioned here, MISP dashboard, but it's not the only one. Um, we have um, a different repository for specific use case. Um, for example, uh, today we release a new tool called MISP Guard, uh, which is a specific tool for uh, people having sensitive networks that need to interconnect MISP instance and want to control the flow of data. It's one of the kind of tools that we develop uh, along with many others. Uh, that are uh, developed over the past uh, past years. But on top of that, I mean, a MISP without any information is not like very useful. We maintain a, a set of knowledge base. The first one that we maintain is the taxonomies. So everything that can be considered as label are described as taxonomies. Um, so nowadays we have close to 200 taxonomies, uh, I think even more. Uh, it's including uh, national classifications, military classifications, it's including a specific uh, label to um, uh, qualify the information, if it's high quality, low quality, things like that, uh, level of alerting. Uh, you have specific taxonomy that are bound to specific software to, uh, uh, for example, I don't know, if you have tools for doing uh, uh, malware analysis and so on, we have those taxonomy there. So um, I advise you to have a look at the taxonomies uh, and usually on the MISP instance, you don't enable everything, uh, but you just enable the subset or even the tax, the tax that are uh, needed for your communities. Uh, for example, the TLP classification is one of the taxonomies there. Then, on, on, on addition to, to taxonomies, we have what we call galaxies. Um, so, it's a nice way to, um, to describe new things. Uh, galaxy is, go is going a bit further than just uh, label and so on. So, you can have full blown uh, description of things that are even connected to each, each other between uh, with relationship. For example, one of, of one that we mentioned is a trade actor one. So we maintain a pretty large trade actor galaxy, uh, which is basically a collection of all the known trade actors, uh, including synonyms, sources, and so on, even relationship, um, to help analysts to have at least a, a knowledge base. Uh, the MISP galaxy itself can be forked in MISP, so that means you can even fork a knowledge base and extend it with your own information that you want to keep for yourself or even share it with, with others. Then we have specific um, uh, lists, like the warning lists, which are maintained by us to, uh, to uh, keep track of potential false positive. This one is containing a lot of lists of different things, like, for example, uh, Microsoft IP addresses, Google domain, things like that. Things that can be interesting if you have seen and you have a hit on that, that might be a false positive or information that are less relevant for automations, for example. So warning lists are important, and it's, again, something that we maintain. All those knowledge base are not only used by MISP, but they are used by many other tools. Um, we make them open. They are under a, a, a very um, liberal license uh, that people can use. And so, in addition to that, and I think it's coming, it came over the time. I mean, for the past, uh, I would say five years now. Uh, as MISP is kind of de facto standard for a lot of organizations and so on, we extract the standard format that we are using, which is pretty stable. Uh, so, for example, the core format didn't change that much for the past 10 years, just with extensions. Um, and the exchange code format is an internet draft that are published under the MISP standard um, organizations, which is independent from MISP. So, nowadays, we standardize the format itself. And not only the, 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 the core format, but we standardize what we call the object template. And this one, I think, is one of the most uh, interesting features of MISP, is to extend the data model of MISP based on your use cases. Uh, nowadays, we have, I think, Hundreds of object templates uh, is coming from uh, cybersecurity ones, financial fraud, intelligence, um, physical security. You have plenty of object models. But if you want to extend it, you can propose your object models, either keep it for yourself or even share it back uh, with us. So those three pillars is already kind of, you know, providing a huge set of software with existing knowledge base. base. So you are not coming when you start a MISP instance, you're not coming from nowhere. You are basically already with a set of tools and data models and so on to support your use cases. In addition to that, we do um, some uh, OS in feed uh, that we make it accessible. For a simple reason, we do that to provide MISP users with examples. Uh, so like that, you don't have empty, again, uh, empty MISP instances. You can uh, feed uh, and get those uh, feeds. Uh, we have some default feed into, uh, into MISP. 
By default, they are imported, but it's depending on the use case, what you want to import. But um, for us, it's important to provide already some kind of information that can be used by the user. Then in addition, uh, we provide uh, compliance documents, training materials. So training materials that we are using today and the next days are all public, all open source. Uh, you can contribute if you see typos and so on, you can, you can use it. I know many organizations that are using the basis to make their own training. That's great. Even commercial one, they're using the trainings to sell commercial trainings. We are fine with that. Uh, everything is open source. Uh, training material can be translated too. There are some translation available. Uh, but we try to provide a lot of documents there. On the HDoc uh, documents, uh, we have a list of, of the repository of the training materials. Um, there's one very interesting, which is a cheat sheet a document of three pages that you can print and then put on your desk is really the basis of MISP. Um, but it's usually a nice uh, cheat sheet when you have uh, forget about something about the API or to do, uh, to do some practical thing with, with MISP. Um, and then next to that, we, we operate some kind of organization called Cross Isaac, um, which is a way to bridge some other communities. Uh, I will not go into details today about this. Uh, maybe on Thursday, I will talk about it, but uh, it's to bridge those communities together and find a way that are for organizations that are using MISP uh, to benefit from other communities that are more into island mode. Uh, but that's more uh, general practices that we, we are working on. So the thing that is important is MISP is sharing. Um, in the example that you will see today, uh, we'll see different way of sharing publication and so on. But here in one slide, I want to, to just um, remind you the different way of sharing information into MISP. So, MISP has by default um, a standard model of sharing, uh, which is four level of sharing. So you can share to your own organizations, you can share to your um, uh, community, you can share to the connected communities or to all organizations. So it's basically a default kind of sharing. If you don't know to who to share, you can select that. That's quite useful when you have like a large community with multiple MISP connected and you want to control the flow of information, you select one of the sharing uh, models, distribution levels. In addition to that, we have what we call sharing groups, uh, which is a granular way of describing where you want to share these information and which who. So you might have, for example, a sharing groups that are geographical regions. It could be sharing groups of um, area of expertise or members of a specific Isaac and so on. And you can mix match this kind of thing. So you can have sharing groups, you can have normal distribution levels. So that's giving you kind of, of, of flexibility uh, of how you want to do uh, sharing. Then on top of that, we have what you call delegations. Um, so in some communities, the one that are originating the information doesn't want to disclose its um, names, but you can delegate and provide pseudo anonymity to the user. So how does it work? It's super easy. Um, we, uh, cre you create a MISP event in your MISP instance, and you can select one of the organizations that are on your instance to publish the event on your behalf. Obviously, they have to accept it. But for example, a, a classical use case is, is you have a, a banking associations in, in a country. Um, banks doesn't want to publish information, but they still want to share to get feedback. So they ask the banking associations to publish on their behalf. And you can have delegation within that network. So it's kind of pseudonymizations, but it's a nice way of doing it. It's included in MISP. You just need to enable it. Um, that's one way of doing it. Then you have additional things of way of sharing, what we call proposal or extended events. Sometimes in MIST, you receive information from uh, third parties that you don't trust or you want to validate or qualify the information. So you can extend an event. So that means you can add a layer of information on top of an existing event. Uh, we'll go back to the event descriptions later on in data modeling. But it's, it's a nice way to uh, make kind of, of, of comparative analysis and so on. So it's, 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 it's a way to extend some specific event, even to keep it for yourself, share it within your teams. Uh, if you receive a work from a third party organization that you don't trust that much, maybe uh, your team member wants to have a review on it, but they can extend the event, keep that one, and they can even have a collapsing view of all those two. Uh, if you want to make some small changes on two event and propose it to someone else, you can make proposals. So classical things are typographic errors in an event. You just propose it and that's it. Uh, in MISP, a MISP instance alone doesn't share by default. You have to set up synchronizations and so on. Uh, MISP provides, I would say, a feature full of, 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 of way of doing synchronizations. Uh, you have one-to-one -one MISP synchronizations. You can even produce statical uh, data in feed systems. So it could be a 
on website, USB key, whatever. And you can even pro, uh, interconnect MISP on complete air gap system. Um, so that's, that's a pretty common way in the intelligence organizations. They want to have a clear separation between the classified network and the non-classified one, and they have an air gap sharing uh, mechanism, which MISP support. Uh, it's bidirectional. So for example, you can start with an air gap system. And if your MISP is connected later on, update, update will be automatic and so on. So it's really, uh, really interesting. Uh, we we can detect duplicate, update on existing events, so it's really part of all this. On top of all the sharing mechanism, we have what we call filtering. So it's quite interesting too. Sometimes you just want to uh, collect specific kind of information, so you create a filter, but you discard all the rest. Interesting for some, some specific use cases. Another thing that is interesting too, you can even um, uh, cache what we call correlation tables or at least correlation values uh, from different MISP instances. So sometimes you don't want to get all the data of a re remote instance. It could be within your organizations. Quick example, you have a MISP instance collecting all the phishing uh, information that you receive. That's great. It's maybe not like super valuable information, but you still want to be able to cache information that from your, I don't know, incident response one. Uh, and in MISP, you can just do that. It's caching all the uh, indicators. And MISP will tell you, oh, this indicator there or this attribute there is matching one that we have on that instance without having a full event. So it's a nice way of, of basically uh, doing uh, uh, cross correlation between instances without having to pull the full data set on a remote instance. And you have additional one where you can even have multiple MISP within the same enclave, which is usually the thing that you do uh, for large organizations, uh, which might have, for example, subgroups, sub activities and so on, and they don't want to, um, to have those kind of rules with the communities and so on for sharing. Um, so it's, it's uh, another way of, of the multiple MISP data becoming to the same organization. So all those sharing mechanisms can be mixed together and you can really design what kind of, of community you have based on those kind of, of, of features. On top of that, um, and that's, I think, one of the uh, key elements of, of uh, CTI and trend intelligence is quality management. So is basically the ability of evaluating the information that are flowing into your different systems. And MISP provides a huge set of tools. Um, some people don't use all the tools, but you can use some of the specific tools to ease your work and to be sure that the information that you are getting into MISP and feeding it back into other MISP or other tools are from a specific quality. So obviously, the first one is correlating data. I mean, when you start to inject data and you see highly correlating values and so on, it might be interesting to review those for quality. Uh, we have even functionalities in MISP regarding uh, highly correlating values. Classical example, uh, you have a sinkhole, uh, IP addresses from uh, security vendors. This is highly correlating values. You might see it in different events. It's not something very interesting, but it's still something relevant for the context. Uh, but MISP can detect it either through the correlations or what we call to the warning list. The warning list are, are basically a list of um, known values that could generate false positive. And that's a flexible one that you can enable. And you can decide, for example, we maintain a list of sinkholes, which give you a hint when you enter a, a, an event in MISP. Oh, this indicator or this IP address is known to be a um, well-known sinkhole. And that's helping the analyst to, to do, to do um, um, error or its uh, work. Then in, in addition to that, we have what we call the sightings, and this one is important, uh, especially on the um, life cycle management of indicators. Um, when you start to have a, a pretty large MISP instance, you might have a lot of indicators. You want to see what are the fresh indicators. And MISP provides you a way to do that, to feedback a system through the CM, through other systems, to say, okay, I've seen it, and this uh, sightings might refresh the uh, values. And this can be used automatically in the life cycle management. Uh, maybe in the next days we will see it. Uh, it's a complete system in MISP to have a profile based uh, life uh, cycle management. So it means that we can have for specific kind of indicators, tags, information, different life cycle management, uh, which makes sense because sometimes you have information that are very ephemeral. I mean, the phishing website is up like maximum two days. 
But you might have, for example, uh, some CNC that might be up for like months uh, because no one is taking care of it. It's a, a bullet poster or it's really under the radar for months. But the sightings, for example, give you a way to refresh it. Oh, I've seen it again. So this one is, is again useful. In addition, we have the enrichment modules. I was, was mentioning in MISP, uh, so you can enrich the data. So the enrichment can be used for uh, qualifying the data. So if, for example, you do passive DNS expansions, I mean, for the one that, of you that are familiar, if you have like an IP, like, I don't know, 25,000 entries, it might be a multi-home machine. And that's maybe it's not so interesting to, to do start pivoting on that. Uh, but it's giving a kind of quality of the information. If it's a multi-home machine, maybe something that is less interesting for further analysis and so on. So this is giving already a lot of in for the analyst. Something that we recently introduced are the workflow system. Uh, so it's a complete workflow in MISP that can be used to review the quality of information, like is it the context set, is it the specific tax set, and so on. And based on that, you can even control the publication of it. So like that, you can even completely block the publications until that it meets a certain level of criteria and requirements that come from, I don't know, the uh, CTI teams for the process of publishing information. So this workflow is really used for quality management in MISP. You can trigger other things like email notifications, things like that. But really one of the core model there is to be sure that before that we publish informations, uh, we check some rules and so on, and the workflow system is there to help. Obviously, you have a, a quite extensive API. So if you want, you can really use the API to pre-analyze information, review the data that you have, and so on. Um, there are plenty of tools doing that already in PyMISP and some examples for that. But that's really important for there for, for evaluating the quality of the information. Another thing that is automatic in MISP is a timeline. Um, we will see uh, some example today about the timelines uh, when creating the information. And the timeline is really providing a way to spot, um, for example, time as error. So it's very common in the forensic report that, oh, why if one indicator that is like one month beyond, beyond uh, maybe it's because it's a typo there, but MISP can give you such kind of information. It will collect as much as it can, first scene, last scene, timestamp information. And by that, by doing that, is able to graphically represent for you a timeline. And if you spot on liars, it's uh, usually very helpful, either for the analysis itself, or uh, either for uh, spotting uh, false positive or mistakes in your uh, report. So to conclude on this quick introduction is, is really uh, the thing that we want to say. It's indeed is a sessions of mistraining and usage but it's really practice that we are talking about. Um, we have seen that a lot of, of, of successful sharing communities are working by imitating what people have shared as information and so on. So for us, MISP is just a tool and it's really how you use it. And for me, it's usage that you will, I would say, create your community and your sharing communities. Either within a team, a SOC, um, with Isaac, with transborder, transnational connections and so on. Same models, but at the end, it's just practices and practices that uh, will uh, help you to make your uh, best community. So again, this is just a tool. Uh, we try to be as transparent as possible. So that's why we have a lot of features in MISP. Um, that's kind of thing that you can say, oh, MISP has a lot of features, indeed. But you can disable some, just select the one that you want to support different, different communities. And as I said, today, if you have any questions, idea, and so on, feel free to ping us to just uh, uh, discuss during in the chat and so on uh, to be able to customize this and so on is really important for us uh, and to support the different use cases. So again, it's a combination of an open source tools, open standards, best practices uh, to make information sharing a reality, uh, which can be, uh, can be challenging. So that's basically it for the introductions. I'm not sure I'm on time. Um, some, oh yes. Um, then, uh, later, we'll have uh, some quick introductions on the usage of MISP, the data model overview, how MISP is uh, uh, actually uh, structures and models. Uh, and this one is quite important because if you start to do kind of integrations um, and start to model your use case and so on, having an idea of things are called in MISP really help you to find the right documentation and so on. Um, so that's really important. So. Um, I will uh, let Sami to work on uh, and show the different data models. Again, don't hesitate to ask questions and so on during during the sessions. Uh, we will try to answer as much as we can. 
uh, and thank you for the uh, listening of this this aspect thank you Sound check. Much better. Awesome. All right. So Alex showed you where we are coming from uh, in, in MISP and where we are going to. And he also mentioned some uh, very MISP specific uh, keywords like taxonomy, MISP object, uh, events, sightings, and so on. So before we start actually diving into MISP, the tool itself, uh, we'll see together some important concepts uh, and the terminology, the basic MISP terminology. Um, however, if you want to have a concise summary of what we are going to talk about, I just want to make a bit of advertisement of our wonderful cheat sheet. Uh, oh, I'm not sharing my screen. Give me a sec. I didn't realize that. Yep. Um, share screen. Desktop one. There we go. All right, uh, so the cheat sheet, I will paste the link in the chat. So that, oh, I don't have access to the chat there. Give me one sec. <clears throat> awesome. Cool, I see that Alex pasted the link already. Uh, so yeah, cheat sheet, very useful. Uh, contains all the concepts, and if you go scroll a bit down, it also show all the data model that we have in MISP with a small explanation of the purpose of the different uh, entity that we have uh, and how it's used. So that's what we are going to, to see right now. All right, so we have two types of data model, or that's how I like to see things. Uh, the first one is the data layer. So the actual data that you store in MISP. And the second one is what we call the context layer. So all the context that you can attach to this data. Um, for the data layer, we'll, we'll have a look at the different things that we have, like events, attribute object, and event reports that contains actual information. And for the context, we'll see that anything that we have in MISP, well, almost anything, can be contextualized using tags. And tags can, can come from different uh, sources, like the free tags, the taxonomy, and the galaxies. So let's start with the data layer, and specifically an attribute. So this is the most basic thing that you can have in MISP. Uh, it's uh, what we call the basic building block. Uh, it's actually what contains uh, all the data that you want to share. So for example, an IP address, a domain name, um, a file hash, uh, binaries and so on, all of these are building blocks that you want to share or to use in your system. And they are what we call attributes. So if you are familiar with uh, sticks, you probably know about uh, indicator and observable. Uh, in MISP, we have a similar concept that that's what we call the IDS, uh, IDS flag that you can set on an attribute or not. Uh, and by just setting this flag on, you can decide if an attribute is an indicator or if it is an observable. Uh, the main reason why we do that with a flag is that from time to time, you can have observable becoming indicators and the other way around. And you can transform one attribute to be uh, an indicator or not by just flipping that flag. So that was for attributes, it's the most basic things. Next, we have a higher level uh, building blocks or an advanced building block. That's what we call MISP objects. So MISP objects are basically containers that contain uh, attributes that make sense together. So for example, you would have a file object that would contain attributes such as the file name, uh, the file size, the different file hashes, uh, the, the dif yeah, well, bunch of things related to uh, an object. And all of these individual uh, attributes, for example, the, the, fi the, the file itself, the file content itself, uh, the different file hashes, such as uh, SHA-1, MD5, and so on, uh, are attributes, but they can be grouped together into a single uh, entity. And that's why uh, what we call MISP object. So I, I gave an example for file, but we also have it for person, for example, 
this is not really a technical information, but we can also represent th uh, non-technical information in MISP, such as a person, where we would have a, a, as attribute inside the person object, the first name, the last name, uh, the gender, uh, and so on. Uh, and, uh, yeah. So that's basically a higher level structure to, to group attributes. Um, then we have what we call MISP event. So there are really containers that contain all information that are contextually linked. So for example, an event would be uh, if you have uh, an incident to encode in MISP, or if you have a daily report to encode. Uh, so that's the higher level structure that contains all the information in MISP. So if you, you can see on the right side, we have a small uh, diagram that shows that an event can contain multiple attributes and it can also contain multiple objects. So this is really the, the, the big envelope uh, that contains the data uh, that are contextually linked. Um, so obviously you can have multiple events in MISP because you want to be able to encode multiple incidents, multiple uh, reports, uh, and so on and so forth. So something that is not shown and I don't think, ah, it is, I updated the slide, that's perfect. This is the event report. So you can see the event report a bit like attribute, uh, but it's even more lightweight than an attribute. In an attribute, you have the value of the attribute. So for example, for uh, an IP address, the value would be like the actual IP address. address. So for example, 8888. Uh, but an attribute also know about its type. So uh, the type would be IP, source or RP destination. Um, so this is information about attributes. But for event reports, uh, they are just reports that contain only text. So they don't have types or anything. So this is really the, the most sim simplest uh, building blocks that we have, but it can be used in such a way that it really enrich and provide a lot of information to all your events, uh, especially because it supports Markdown so that you can also format it and provide more uh, description or more information about uh, the event you are currently working on. But also it includes a special syntax that you can use to reference the different entities that are contained in, inside one event. We'll see that uh, in, in, in a demo later on. Now for creating relationship between entities, by entities I mean misp object or attributes, uh, we are using what we call object reference. So they basically they are just basically a relationship that you can create and say things like this, uh, uh, this domain name is serving or delivering this file. Uh, so you have a source, a destination, and then you can add uh, a keyword or a verb to, to, express, to express what, uh, what, what is that object reference. And they really can turn flat data like a list of attributes on object into a connected graph because you can really create stories with all of uh, all of these arrows and saying things like that a file uh, was received from a specific domain and that that file instructed uh, once it's executed the download of another file which tries then to exfiltrate data to this specific url so you can really describe a lot of things with these object references uh, this is an example of what you could have in MISP if you start to encode uh, object and if you start to use object references. So you can see we have some nodes, which are actually MISP objects, and we have the references uh, that are what we called object reference. We also call, call them uh, relationships. So we can see, for example, for that specific example, uh, that a file uh, uh, drops another file, which drops uh, a third one, and Finally, the just Panda Bank file or malware tries to connect to that IP address. Uh, IP port, but it's actually a domain that is shown here. Uh, yeah, so you can really have a connected graph that tells a story by just looking at it. Now, this is a high level overview of what uh, an event, a complete event looks like. Obviously, you will see in MISP uh, uh, in, in the next uh, session how to create this data and how you can use MISP to, to create such kind of event. Uh, but we'll just go quickly over it so that you have a, a, a good overview for the newcomers uh, uh, in MISP. Uh, 
So at the top level, you have information about the event itself. So a small title uh, that describe what this event is about. Uh, some meta information about the state of this event, uh, the ownership of the event and how it should be distributed uh, and who can access the data contained inside this event. More about that later on. Then information about context attached to this event with galaxies and taxonomies. We'll see that in a moment. We haven't seen context layer yet, but it's next slide. And then some uh, what we call the intelligence visualization widgets. So basically the timeline that Alex mentioned uh, previously, uh, the event graph that allows you to uh, see connection between uh, object and attributes and even report uh, allowing you to, to like describe event or, or incident. And then finally, the event can contain multiple attributes and objects. All right, now let's see about the context layer. So as I said previously, we have tags. Basically, this is what it is all about context. They are basically tags, but the source of these tags, where they are coming from, are a bit different. So let's start with the simplest one, the free tags. Uh, they are basically just free text, uh, free label that you can, that any user can set without any restriction. So if you want to create a tag uh, named uh, my super tag, you can do it. That's fine. However, not everyone will understand what that means. So that's why we created what we call taxonomies, where taxonomies are basically a list of tags that is normalized uh, so that we can use the same vocabulary and everyone can understand what, what, what that tag means because it's normalized and defined uh, in a standardized way. And lastly, we have galaxies. Galaxies are basically like taxonomies, but they are more complex because they contain more data. Uh, you will see an example and you will understand what that means. So let's have a look at free tags. So as I said, everyone can set uh, the tag name as they want, uh, but you can immediately see that giving freedom to users can lead to problems. Uh, so this is a screenshot that I took from uh, one of our instance. Uh, you can see that uh, human creativity knows no bound uh, to express exactly the same thing. And if you are used to writing scripts or creating automation or aggregating data, you can immediately understand that it is difficult to deal with. Uh, especially that we, you have different ways to, to write actually the same thing. So that's why you shouldn't use free tag unless you want it or you want them to be used only internally or by your team. Now for the taxonomies, these are actually what you should try to use instead. Uh, everything is standardized. So on that screenshot, you can see another, uh, uh, another taxonomy than the TLP taxonomies. Uh, this one is about how, wh what is the status of an event? So if an event is complete, if it's a draft, if the, the event is currently being worked on and so on. And by using these tags, you can really create automation and workflows. Uh, yeah, that's also the name of the taxonomy, but you can really create uh, automation and everyone understand immediately what, what that tag is about because everyone knows about it and it is standardized. Now for Galaxy, there are, you can see them basically like taxonomy. So they're also normalized set of vocabularies, but they also include more information. So if I go back to the taxonomy, just to make the difference between the two, you can see by just reading the tag, for example, the first one, workflow state complete. Well, I think it's self-describing. You don't need additional information about it. By just reading the tag, you know that the status of this event is complete. Um, but if I go back to the Galaxy now, if we have a look at, for example, a thread actor, uh, in this case, it's APT29 that is currently showed uh, on screen. Uh, if we talk about APT29, um, this might not be a name that is used by other vendor. A uh, lot of uh, thread actors have different synonyms. In addition to that, you also have uh, meta information that you can add to this thread actor. So for example, who are the victim of this thread actor? Uh, is this thread actor state sponsored? 
uh, in f from which country is this act trade actor coming from? Uh, and in addition to all of this uh, meta information that you can have, you can also have a relationship between different uh, trade actors, or even uh, in that case, uh, it's using uh, the attack, uh, the Maitre attack uh, uh, galaxy. Uh, which we'll see a bit later on also, if you are not familiar with this uh, with this framework. But you can also express the fact that a trade actor uh, is similar to another one, or that this trade actor is using these techniques to, uh, to, to compromise uh, other systems. So it really has more information. If you have another, uh, if you would have another example of galaxies, uh, we could take uh, the country galaxy, which is another one that I like because it's also really easy. For example, a country, uh, we have, uh, for example, Luxembourg, that would be a galaxy cluster. And Luxembourg, you could have the, the TLDs associated to Luxembourg, the language spoken, the currency used, and so on. So all of this information can be at, can are contained inside this, this tag. So that's just to make the distinction between taxonomies and galaxies. Now, a quick word about correlation in MISP, that's, really, that's going to be really quick. So in MISP, we have a system that we call correlation engine that is used to create link between different attributes that we have. Uh, something that is worth noting is that these correlation link cannot be created inside an event. They are created across event. The main reason is when you encode an event, if we take, for example, if you encode an incident, you don't really, there is no point in creating an attribute with the same value inside this event, because it already exists. But if we see a correlation with another incident, so let's say an IP address or domain name, domain name would be interesting, that we see a correlation between a domain that is contained inside your, your the incident you are currently encoding and another incident that was, uh, uh, that another organization had like two days ago, this is really valuable information. So that's why we only create correlation between uh, across event. Uh, yeah, we have different kind of correlation uh, type, not going to go too much in, in, into that, but just to, to give you the idea that correlation are done across event and only for attributes. So that's it. Yeah, that we are going, going to see that uh, tomorrow. So. That's basically it for the, the quick overview of the terminal gen concept. Uh, if if you need to to have a refresher of what have what we've gone through so far, feel free to have a look at the cheat sheet. Uh, I think now it's a good time to do a five minute break, um, and after that five minutes because I think how many time do we have? Five or ten minutes? Five minutes. So we'll do a five minute break uh, now. And after that, we'll jump straight into MISP. We'll do a demo on what the application looks like. And uh, we'll encode uh, a complete event uh, starting from scratch. So we'll, have a we'll give you a situation, explain what we are going to, to do with, uh, with that uh, incident that we are going to encode. Uh, and then we'll start to create data, uh, contextualize it correctly, create the relationship, uh, and use everything or almost everything that is possible in MISP to create really uh, a con uh, context rich event, let's say. All right. So see you in five minutes then. There we go. All right. So before jumping straight into MISP, um, I just have something to mention. So if you go back in the in the training pad that we have, uh, we also provide a public uh, test MISP instance that you can use. This is the, the link. And you can join 
uh, by using this credential. So you take one username, you can choose the number from one to 50. So for example, this is an example for the training 12. And then you have the password. So feel free to log in, feel free to play with MISP, create event attributes, uh, check some events uh, out. Uh, you're basically admin, so you can do almost whatever you want, but please just don't change the password of other users or mess up with the setting of the instance. Uh, we have a way to revert everything back, but if you would be kind to not force us to do that, that would be great. Um, all right, so now, um, so I have the instance, MISP instance there. Uh, and let's have a really very quick overview of what you are currently seeing. So as soon as you log into a MISP instance, you will land on the event index page. So it's basically all events uh, that have been created in your MISP instance, either created by your organization, other organization that have access to your MISP instance, or events that are coming from feeds, or other MISP instance you are currently connected to. Uh, so on the event list, you see who is the creator, so who is the uh, organization that created this event. Uh, information about the context, so for example, uh, we have here some galaxies cluster that are attached uh, that are about crypto locker attack pattern also from the from the mitre attack framework uh, galaxy some tags all of them are coming from taxonomies so you have the workflow state zoom a bit uh, the tlp uh, taxonomy and so on the number of attributes the last time this event was modified, information about the, this event. So by information, I mean a concise summary or also called the event title uh, of what this event is about. And then the distribution of this event. So by distribution, it means who can view this data and how it can be shared uh, if you are synchronizing your MISP instance with another one. So you can, obviously, this is an index, so you can search it, uh, you can filter it, you can sort it. And if you, and you are probably are admin on your MISP instance, you can also start creating data by creating events. Uh, so to create an event, it's on this button. Uh, but I will not create junk data. I will use a fake uh, incident that we have, uh, that I have a summary of. And what we will do is we will encode it as, as if it was a real incident and as if we were going to use this data to protect ourselves, but also to share it to partners so that they can also protect themselves. So if you go back on your uh, on the training pad, uh, this is the exercise that you are going to do. So it's basically, uh, this is basically the context. So. The, the idea is you, you as uh, the telecommunication CSERT of Luxembourg, you are receiving an email uh, from a telecommunication CSERT of another telco company in Luxembourg called Fake Company. And the mail subject is attempt, uh, there's a typo there, attempted spear phishing. Uh, and this is the content of the mail. Uh, so there, we don't really care. Uh, and they say that the, their company had a failed spear phishing attempt that targeted their CEO. And then they provide the details about this spear phishing. So it, the mail says that they received, the CEO received an email on a specific date containing a personalized message. Then the attacker that sent the email pretended to be working for the school of the CEO's daughter and the attacker, the attacker sent the mail from a spoofed address, which is this one. And from this spoof address, we can deduce a first name and last name, which are John Do, and it actually is uh, the teacher of the student, so the teacher of the CEO's daughter. Uh, the C-Cert also provides you that 
the information that this email was received from a specific domain. And they, are, they also include the IP address that resolved to this domain at that time. And in addition to that, they also uh, say that the email, the email received by the CEO contained a malicious file, uh, which is attached, which is this one. And that file tries uh, to download a secondary payload from a specific URL. They also provide you uh, the IP address uh, that resolved to this URL. And they say that this secondary payload, which is this one, uh, is trying to explore a specific CV. And they say that after a brief triage, uh, the secondary payload has an R coded C2. Uh, we have the information about the C2, so another URL and an IP. And they say that this, uh, this secondary payload is self exfiltrating local credential to this C2. And then they conclude the mail by saying that this is how far they've gotten uh, and that they are still, uh, this is still an ongoing investigation. And they, they would like to avoid informing the attacker that it was a, a failed spear phishing so that it didn't succeed. Uh, and so they ask you to only use the information contained in there to protect your constituent. So what does that mean? That means that you are, as uh, the recipient, you can only, only uh, do passive, uh, uh, passive information uh, cross-check or passive defense. So that means you cannot scan back uh, the attacker network and you cannot try to access uh, the, uh, the attacker infrastructure. So that's what it, that's basically mean. All right. So. Now that we know about the context and we have all our information at end, let's try to encode this 17 MISP. So, so, to start encoding information, as we saw previously, everything, uh, so attributes and uh, MISP object are always contained inside one event. You cannot have floating attributes objects. So we have to start by creating an event. So to create an event, you click on add event, and then you are asked to provide information about this event, obviously. So date, uh, the distribution, we don't really care. Thread level, it's up to you. This can be augmented by using according taxonomy uh, so that you can really be more precise about what thread level is this event about, and the analysis if it is initial, ongoing, or completed. And again, this information can also be uh, completed with uh, the workflow taxonomy, the one that we saw previously, if you want to be more precise about the current state of the analysis. And then you have to provide the event info, so basically the title of the event, and it's basically a quick description uh, of what this event is about. Um, now, it's always best to use English in that field if you can. Uh, because if you decide at some point to share this event with partners that are not picky, uh, speaking the language uh, you encoded this event in, uh, it might be tricky for them to understand what this is about. So obviously, if you don't, if, if, if you don't plan to, to, to share it with, uh, with other uh, speak, uh, with, with people speaking different languages, you don't really care. But... If, if, if you plan to, or if you think that at some point you might share this information with partners uh, or internationally, the better to use English. So let's write a concise description of what this event is about. Uh, so I've written it plenty of times, so I guess I will have a documentation for that. Uh, kind of like this one. So fail spear phishing attempt targeting telco company in Luxembourg. So by just reading that, I immediately see or uh, what this is about. Extend event, let's skip that for now. It's not really relevant for uh, our exercise. Let's hit submit. And you can see that a bunch of stuff already happened in the background. So we created our event. Uh, it automatically assigned the creator and the ownership of this event to the organization, to my organization, which is the training organization. And then it automatically created some tags and attached them to, the, to this event. This is uh, 
instance specific configuration that we've set up for that instance, you will probably not have it. Uh, so probably on your MISP instance, or if you uh, install a new uh, instance, you will not have this tag added automatically. This is just something that you can set up in the configurations. So let's get rid of some of these tags. So this is not TLP white um, because they, they ask us not to, to inform too many people. So this is not TLP white. I will just remove them quickly. Uh, this is not an OSINT event. And yeah, we can say that this event is a draft. It's the state of this event is draft, so this is fine. Um, then we have a big warning saying that this event is basically empty and that it's not really usable because it has no data, which is a totally valid warning. So we'll start populating this event. Uh, all right. So what I like to do when I encode event is always to start encoding the data first. So all of these indicators, so the, uh, the email address, the IP, uh, the IP addresses, uh, the domain name, the URL, and so on. And afterward, to uh, attach the context. Uh, you could already attach the context uh, at the event level if you wish. Uh, I like to do it at the end. So that's what uh, we will do. So let's start by encoding our data. So what do we have? Um, so we have uh, an email that was received. Um, and this email was sent from um, a spoofed address. Uh, so what we could do is to uh, quickly, oops, encode this email. Well, we don't actually have the email, uh, but we could already start by encoding the person and include this as an email. So let's start by doing that. So that we also see that you can include and encode in non-technical information in MISP. So a good reminder. So to create uh, an attribute or an object, it's on the left side. So if I wanted to, to create just an attribute, that would be, for example, for the person, it would be the first name, the last name, or the email address. It would be best if we encode all of these three attributes inside uh, a MISP object now. So uh, as these three attributes are related together, we will create an object. So click on add object, and then you have to, to pick a category. If you don't know in which category the object is in, I, I never know which one it is, so I pick always all object. And then I know that I want to encode a person. So we'll search for the person object. And now we pick the person. Uh, now we have a lot of information that we can fill, but we are only required to provide at least one of these attributes. So first name, last name, full name, alias or render. If you have one of these uh, with a value, it's fine, we can create the object. So last name, we know that's Doe. Full name, John Doe. And first name, that's John. Uh, alias, uh, we could put, uh, maybe we could put it as role, if you have a role. Email, we have the email, so we can include the email. Text role. So who is John Doe? It's most probably a victim. It's most probably a victim because he was impersonated by the attacker. Because if he was the, the uh, teacher of the CEO's daughter. So it's most probably a victim. Um, let's say that he's a male also. And I will also add as a comment because I could not find a, a good, uh, oh, actually we have a function here, function of natural person such as analyst. We could add in their teacher of the CEO's daughter. There we go. So I'm happy with it. Let's hit submit. Let's quickly review what we have here. Everything sounds good. 
click on create object and if we scroll down now we have our person that has been encoded awesome now what other indicator do we have indicator or even uh, supportive data because not everything is and should be an indicator in this um, so we have our throwaway provider uh, that deliver the mail that contain the malicious file. So we can encode this, uh, this information in MISP. So we have a domain, we have an IP address. These two are linked uh, because this IP resolved to this domain. So instead of creating two attributes, uh, it, let's create an object that contain the two. So to create an object, once again, we go on add object. Uh, this time, I know it's in the network category. And what we are trying to encode is something that is both a domain and an IP. So we can use the domain IP object. So to, to have a valid domain IP object, it must have at least one of these attributes. So an IP, a domain, or a host name. So in our case, we have yeah, that's fine. We have the domain. Oh, no, that's not correct. This is the domain. And I will also copy the IP address. IP. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Seems good. So we can also add a comment to help to help us later on and to ex to say what what this object is about. We know that this is uh, origin of uh, uh, of the mail. So that the mail was received from. Then we can hit submit. We can quickly review if everything is all right. And it is, so let's click create object. And now we have our domain IP object. All right, so let's continue. They said that the email contained a malicious file. Um, so this is a malicious binary. So we can encode it in MISP. So if, if you are currently doing the exercise alongside uh, or at the same time, uh, don't worry about this executable. They are basically putty.exe. Um, so they are absolutely not malicious, unless you consider Putty as a malicious software. Um, okay, so to add an, uh, an attachment, so because this is an attachment, uh, because we want to also not, we want to include the actual binary in MISP, uh, you have to click on add attachment. It's taking a bit of time to load. In the meantime, what I could also do is to prepare the attachment. There we go. So we could browse and uh, and well select which file to be uploaded. I will just oops, drag it. Uh, and then uh, this payload, we know that it delivers another payload. Uh, distribution, we can let it and we can specify as contextual command that this is the wonderful initial payload re received by mail from the spoofed address. All right, so we also have uh, two options that we can check here. First one if is if this file is a malware sample or not. This is really important. So if this one, if the file you are currently uploading is a malware sample, so in our case, we consider that it is, uh, MISP will automatically encrypt uh, that file and compute its file ashes and save it as an object. So that you would have the, the, the file object. So you would have the, the actual payload. You would have the file name, the file size, and all the file ashes uh, computed automatically. Uh, if you don't check this box, it will just be a simple attachment uh, and users uh, will be able to download it as this, which may be dangerous, especially if they execute it. 
So if it's a malware sample, please tick this box. We also have another one, which is called advanced extraction. Uh, if it's a ma malware sample, you can also request MISP to perform an advanced extraction. And what, what that feature will do is it will extra extract the different PE section uh, that you have inside this binary. Uh, so usually you want to do it uh, if you import uh, a malicious uh, file. But in our case, in the context of this example, I will not do it because we will create additional object and it will make the event less readable. Uh, so I will not check this box. Then you hit upload. And if we scroll down, we can see that we have our file that has been uploaded. So we have the different file hashes, the file name, the size, and the actual payload that we can immediately download by clicking on this link. Okay, so let's continue. What do we have next? Um, next, uh, we know that we have a secondary payload that was downloaded from a location, which is this one. So let's start by encoding the location. So we have an URL, we have an IP address. So we have two attributes, one of the type URL, another one of the type IP, uh, IP source. Uh, but these two are linked together once again. So we could create an object composed of these two. So let's go back. Let's add an object. Um, in our case, this is an URL. And let's add this URL link. Uh, no credential. We could even decompose it with domain. This is not important. This is not important. Um, we don't have query string. Uh, Got the resource path. Uh, seems good. And now let's add the IP address. Um, Seems good. So you can see that if you had multiple IP addresses related to this uh, URL, you could also expand the IP field by clicking on this small arrow, and you can add multiple IP addresses there. Uh, let's take HTTPS. Let's submit. Let's review our own. Ah, we forgot to do something. We forgot to add a small comment. So this. Um, Secondary payload was downloaded from that location, so I can add that. Maybe we can answer the, some of the questions. Uh, I cannot hear you. Maybe we can answer some of the questions. Um, there was a question of Alfredo regarding um, the use of attribute or object or um, which one are available as objects for cybersecurity related threats and so on. Um, so the, the practice is the following, and I think it's, it's a very good question. Um, so attributes was, I would say, first when created an history in MISP, but nowadays what we recommend is to first look as object and attribute, I would say, are more edge cases. Um, so if you start to uh, create a MISP event and add object or attribute, always check in the object list what is available. Um, so it's a link I paste in the chat. Um, usually the, you have the majority of objects there are for cybersecurity are there. Uh, if you are missing a specific one, uh, don't hesitate to, to tell us, but usually they are, they are there. Uh, so the attribute case, uh, I would say, are more edge cases or thing that doesn't need to have contextualization around uh, because object is basically, a, like Sammy explained, is, is basically a container with multiple attributes having the same consistent um, model. So um, uh, it's indeed important to uh, to have a look at first as object before going into into attributes. Um, Scott has a, another good questions too um, uh, regarding is there a way to just pass the content, the paste the content, and have automatically uh, the detections? And I think Sammy will will do it later uh, with a complete description of of the free text import. And how to generate even to subselect things from the free text import to generate object out of it. Uh, but I think we'll show it later. So uh, yeah. please uh, don't spoil. Yeah. 
Yeah, so Scott has a good question, and it, it's in the follow-up. Um, uh, yeah, another good question regarding domain IP. Is it IP destination, IP source? Um, so it's, it's, I would say, subject to discussions, um, depending on, on from which perspective you are looking. So, I mean, obviously, when you have a destination, CNC is usually an IP destination. Uh, sometimes for email delivery, it might be a source or IP source. Uh, I don't remember exactly this case, but uh, sometimes it's subtle where you are and how you see the perspective where you are seeing as a source or as a destination. Yeah, for example, for the for the URL object, um, you can see in the object definition that uh, the IP is this IP destination, uh, but it depends uh, from which perspective you are looking at things. So in the case where we uncode it, uh, I would have put IP source because uh, this is the source from which the secondary payload is downloaded from. Uh, but you can also see the other way around, like the first payload try to access that URL, which is located at that IP. So for, you can also see it as a destination. So this is really subject to discussion. And I guess it's also depending on the case, like Alex uh, suggested. Um, were there other questions that I missed? Um, I think it's fine. fine. Um, I'll answer it uh, in the chat too. Um, so. Awesome. So let's proceed with thing. But please con continue the, the question. Uh, we love to receive the question and feedback. That means that you are interested in what we are actually showing. All right. Um, so that I can close. So let's save. Let's save our URL. Perfect. And I can already encode the secondary payload now. So again, click on add attachment. So I have it already prepared. This is, this is not malicious. Oh, did I do it the other way around? Now I'm confused. Which one did I encode it? Malicious, so taxi. And it was a first sample. All right, that's good. So this is not malicious, it's the second malware sample. Secondary payload. Uh, again, this is a malware, so you encrypt and hash it. And I don't want to check that box so that we keep our event like small and clean. Uh, this one, let's say it's payload installation and we can upload it. Great. So let's proceed. We have a CV. Um, that we can also, oops, that we can also encode. So the CV here is not linked to any other data. So we don't have like a new URL and an IP associated to it. We just have the CV. So in that case, we will create an attribute. So we click on add attribute. Um, in our case, it's called external analysis. There we go. And then it's called vulnerability. I can paste the value. Contextual command is not needed. Intrusion detection system. So basically, this is the famous two IDS flag that I mentioned at the beginning of the terminology uh, slides uh, to make the distinction between indicators and observables. So basically, is this an attribute that you would like to feed to intrusion detection system or not? Not really. It's just a CV number. Uh, yeah, the other option are not really worth having a look at for the moment. So let's submit it. Let's check. And we have our attribute there. Super. And what do we have? Um, secondary payload. We have the art coded C2. This is a very important one. So we have an URL. We even have a port and we have an IP address. So let's take this one and let's, once again, we have two attributes and the, the two are linked together so we can create an object. All object and then this is a URL. I can paste the URL. I can take the domain name. Um, I can take the IP address. I 
Ah, a port. This is very important. So this is a very high port. So maybe it's worth to encode it as a separate attribute and to apply special care with it. If it would be a low port or even like the standard HTTP or HTTPS port, it would not be relevant to our case. But in this one, as this is a very high port, I think it's worth uh, making it as its uh, as an uh, own attribute. Um, yeah, I'm fine with it. So I can also add a comment. Uh, so this is the C2 location. Submit. Ah, so we have. Did I mess up? No, I didn't. So this is the object that I created. And now this one tells me that we have a similar object. So you can see that uh, MISP detected that some part of this object already exists in another object encoded in this event and gives us a uh, overlap number. So 20% of what we have here are already contained inside another one. Uh, I guess it's due to the evil provider one uh, and the scheme also, which is the same. So these are two separate entities. I can just create a new object without having to worry about. But in case you are encoding large event, this can be really helpful to avoid duplicating data. So let's create the object. Let's check everything is there. That's perfect. And this is basically it. Uh, maybe there's some interesting questions. Uh, Scott is asking to, to repeat what is the idea, two ideas flag. Uh, to explain that it's automation and automations. Um, maybe we can take the example of a malware. Um, so imagine that you do some reversing of a malware, and this malware is testing the internet connectivity and is using uh, uh, the, the uh, open resolver from Google 8888, send a DNS packet there. Um, then when you do the analysis, you might create um, IP destinations 8888, but usually this one is not an IP address that you want to block or use as a detection factor, but it's still contextual information. So in this case, you won't set the two IDS flag, um, meaning that this um, uh, attribute will be just be context. So it's technically uh, an observable, uh, something that you can observe, but it's not something that you can conclude and, and use it as a, uh, I would say, a determining, determining factor saying that this information is, is valuable and so on. Um, we use that the two IDS flag in, in, in MISP to decide if this information can be automatically processed by tools and so on. And if you unset the two IDS flag, it's contextual information is there, but it's usually something that you want to avoid. Uh, I hope it's clear, Scott. There's something that I might add uh, in addition to that. Um, is that for some specific export, whenever you are using the API, um, attribute that don't have the IDS flag set will not be exported. So if you are exporting using Snort or Bro rules, uh, Yara export and so on, all attributes that don't have this flag will not be exported. Because as Alex mentioned, if you have an attribute with 8888, you don't want to block or to alert you that this domain, uh, that this IP address was accessed. Um, but for example, uh, in our case, this IP of the uh, evil provider uh, this is something that you want to export uh, and to possibly block or at least alert it or trigger an alert in your sim. Uh, so this is important to have the IDS flag set. So we have some same same default value depending on the attribute type. So for example, URL, domain, and IP, you can see that by default it sets the IDS flag, uh, but for some it doesn't. For example, the port uh, usually it doesn't because if you have if you encode port 80 or port 443 and you export it and block it, a lot of people will not really be happy about it. Uh, but this is actually a very good uh, thing. If, if you think that this port is only used for malicious things, you can already check the IDS flag for this one so that it will be also included in the export. Um, yeah. And later on, you can unset it because this is just a flag in the end. 
uh, another example could be, for example, uh, the, the file, so these binaries. So this file hashes uh, should uh, trigger a warning or be blocked by your, uh, by your protective tools. But the file name itself, this is, I mean, protective tool, we don't care about the file name itself. Uh, but the, the actual payload, so the actual binary, this is also something that you want to, to block. Okay, so I think we've encoded basically everything in the event. Uh, let's quickly review it. Uh, so we have the two payloads, we have uh, the domain name with the provider, we have the two URL. Hmm, that's good. So before adding the context, um, I like to start linking these different elements uh, between, uh, between each other. Because right now we just have a, a flat list. Uh, uh, we would just we just have a. a there's, there's a question regarding: Would you attach the email al also, so to tie them together? It's from Andy. Ah, that's a good question. So this email is actually not something that I consider as a, as an indicator, because we don't have the original email. This is just an email that we received from the, the fake uh, tele telco company. Uh, so we don't have the, the original email. If you would have the original email, uh, absolutely, I would include it uh, and add the payload, the malicious.exe payload that was contained inside this email uh, in the event. But I don't have it, unfortunately, uh, because the, the fix uh, telco company didn't send it to, to us, uh, if that makes sense. But what we could do, actually, uh, is to encode this original, well, this, this email in the in the event uh, for posterity and so that we the 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 viewer of the data so the the user that uh, the are reading this event knows or at least they, they know where this data is coming from so that's something we could do so to do that we could either create a specific uh, attribute that would contain all of this email or we could also create an event report for that. And let's do that. It's actually a good idea. So let's add an event report. We just paste the content as is. And as a title, um, I will set a mail received uh, from, which was it again? Cesar. I will not give too much names from Cesar of Delco Company. Of uh, let's let's say victim telco company. So we have now we have the source here that we can have a look at. Um, but we will check event report later on. Uh, so uh, we had multiple times the question uh, or the comment that, well, this is great, you can encode this information, but it's really annoying to do. Is there a way that MISP could like just ingest everything and try to parse things out and create uh, data directly? Yes, there is one. I will just show you quickly. So there are two ways to do it. I will show the quick and dirty way. And then later on, I will show how you can do it more properly or at least more interactively. So if you go on the, the event itself, you have this small button called populate using the free text import tool. You click on it, you paste your text, you submit, and MISP will automatically ap apply some really advanced uh, uh, AI uh, function. Uh, no, I'm just kidding, they are just regexes, uh, but just to extract data out of the text that was uh, submitted. So you can see it picked up the email address, the different domain, the IP, the URL, uh, even the CV. And then if you submit, so you can also change the type if it's needed. Uh, can check the IDS, uh, the correlation status, the comment. Uh, you can even add tags in this, uh, in this view. And if you are happy with it, you can click on submit and it will create attributes immediately out of these. Um, but the reason why I like to, to do it this way is first because I can show you how to do it 
uh, step by step, uh, but also because I can create objects which are better than flat attributes. Um, now, if you if you would have done this using the free text import tool, uh, there is still one way to convert this attribute into an object. You just need to select an attribute uh, by clicking on this uh, checkbox. I'm not sure if it works for uh, attribute inside an object. Let's see. And then click on this small button that says group selected attribute into an object. Ah. So it doesn't work for attribute that are inside an object. Uh, but I click on it and then it proposes, misproposes me, uh, the object that accept this attribute uh, as a valid attribute. So I could convert actually this CV inside, uh, into, sorry, uh, a vulnerability object. Uh, so fastest way would be to just paste everything in there, create the attributes, add contextual comment if you want, it's not, not needed. Uh, then submit these attributes and then combine them into an object. Uh, and the reason why I would um, combine into object is uh, because we we will and I would like to create relationship between this entity, and that's what we are going to do. But I think Alex had something to. It's a, it's an interesting discussion from Irun, and uh, knowing a bit Irun, I'm not surprised having good questions. <laughs> um, it's regarding the um, uh, object similarities and object correlations. Um, Technically, when we import a new object uh, and create a new object on, on the same event, um, we have this functionality that is showing off uh, that the object, similar object with similar attribute exists. Maybe you can show one, I don't know. Um, and what maybe uh, he was thinking is to have something that is showing this in the event view directly. So instead that when we add the, uh, I would say a similar object. Um, this view is, is basically uh, visible for objects that are uh, similar within the same event view. Yeah, so Sami, what he's doing right now is creating an object with some similar uh, entries. And you see that there you have this kind of, of okay, there's already an object with having a similar structure and having the similar value there. Now the question is like, could we have something similar on the event view, saying that there is already a list of objects that are similar? So for, for what I understood from Irun, um, uh, Irun, do you want to add some more uh, questions there? You can take the mic if you want. Uh, no, no, but uh, just to explain a bit, uh, we have some situations where there's already a populated event. There is some data automate, uh, coming in in an automated way. And if there's a lot of objects, it's uh, very complicated to figure out yourself if there are some, what, what I would call correlations between the objects. For example, user accounts with similar email or people that have the same last name and first name, things like that. Uh, I see what you mean. So it's a good point indeed. Um, so I have to simplify the visualization of the event if they are similar objects or objects which have similarities. Okay, technically we do it for the import, but not really at the visualization. But okay, okay. We, I will go back to your um, to your issue and maybe add some more uh, notes there, and uh, uh, we can we can discuss uh, within the team how we could approach these issues. But it's it's a good indeed a good point. Thank you. Well, to to continue on the question, I see that we have one about wildcard. So we don't really have wildcard for object. If I understand the question correctly. Uh, but what you could do if you had multiple IP addresses is to add them uh, because you can, this, the IP is a multiple field, so you could add them like this if you had another one. Um, but we don't have a multiple field for port. Um, this is something that can be changed in the object template. I'm not sure if it's relevant or not, to be honest. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I see the, I see your point. Having a way to, to add multiple ports would make sense, actually, now that I think about it. So this is something that we could change. Um, 
but we'll see in details uh, in the following trainings uh, how you can manage these object templates and how you can modify them. Uh, but yeah, that's something that we could change on, on our side. So there is a complementary question there regarding the CIDR block. Um, that's supported by MISP, so you can add CIDR block in MISP. Uh, and there is uh, what we call advanced correlations. Uh, so if you enable it, you have even correlation between CIDR blocks. So for example, if you have an IP matching, one of the CIDR block is supported. So uh, CIDR block are uh, fully supported into uh, IP source and destination, so you can, you can use it. Uh, either IPv4 and IPv6 uh, without any problems. Just if you want the correlations, don't forget to enable advanced correlations, if I recall correctly, in the options of your uh, MISP settings. Talking about correlation, so it seems there is a, a need to expand a bit on that. So there are three types of correlation. The first one is what we call the, the basic one. It's exact string matching. So the value of two attributes must be the, exactly the same. Then there, there is the CIDR blocks correlation. So if an IP is contained inside the CIDR block, we also have a correlation. So you have an example here. Uh, and the last one is using SSD. So SSD is a fuzzy hashing library uh, that creates uh, a what, what we call fuzzy hash uh, that can be used to, to correlate uh, closely, uh, uh, what, close binary that are close binary wise. Uh, so you can set the, the, the threshold uh, in the configuration. So if you have two binaries that are using the same set of libraries and when they compile, they look kind of the same, uh, you, you would have a correlation between the two. Uh, all right. So let's go back to our, to our event. Um, so you've noticed that we used a lot of objects. That's because single attributes Nowadays, don't really make sense. Everything is more or less linked to another thing. Uh, and by talking about linking things to one another, let's start to create relationship between the different entities that we've created so that we can really have a story uh, between these elements. So what we can say first um, is how can you create this relationship? Well, there are two ways. The first one is to create them immediately from the table here. So for example, this URL, this is another Revit provider. You, you could say that uh, this is, if I remember correctly, this is the C2 server. So you could say that uh, this malware is exfiltrating data to this URL by clicking on this add reference and then exfil exfiltrates to, and then you would have to pick the UID uh, or the ID of this object. So in our case, this is probably this one. But you can see that it's not really convenient to, to create this relationship because we are, when you are dealing with relationship, you are dealing with nodes and edges. So you are dealing with a graph. So it makes sense to do things in a graph, right? So that's why we have the event graph. So the event graph uh, shows you the current representation of an event and the relationship contained inside one event. But it's also uh, a tool that can be used to edit and create relationships. So right now we have some unreferenced attributes and some unreferenced object. So let's, let's start by creating these relationships. Um, so initially we had uh, this John Do that sent one email uh, and that email contain a file. And the first uh, file was malicious.exe, so this one. So what we could say um, is that Mr. John Do add reference. Oops. Oops. He sent this file. Click submit and poof, you have the relationship created. So what does this file do? Well, he downloads another one. And we also know that he was received from this throwaway provider. So I can expand this object to see its content by pressing, pressing the X button. And if I look here, yeah, this is the provider. 
So I can say that this file was received from. So I can click on edit, add reference. And I can say, oops, typo. Oh, we don't have received from. Okay. Related. Uh, so received from, we could use sent again, but don't really want to, to use that. I really would like to use received from. So in the event where you don't have the keyword or the, the relationship type that you want to use, there is a, a trick. You could use the custom one. And if you use the custom one, uh, you have uh, a free text entry that is created. So usually it's best to try to, to find a keyword that is already included here. Uh, but if you don't find it, you can still use uh, uh, one that you create yourself. So received from. There we go. Okay. So we also know uh, that this file downloads another one, the secondary payload, this one. So instead of clicking on edit and then adding, I can also press the shift key to immediately drag and, and drop the arrow. Uh, and this file downloads another one. So he downloads the secondary payload. Click on submit. Oops. So what else do we have? We have one URL, we have another URL. This uh, secondary payload was downloaded from a specific location, which is this one, Evil Provider, this is not malicious. So I think it is this one. Let's check quickly. I expand it. I see the resource pass, that's fine. So I can say that it was downloaded from. And we have the verb, that's perfect. And the last one, another Evil Provider. This is the C2 server where the secondary payload exfiltrates data to. So I can do that and select exfiltrates to. Hmm, that's not so, that's not too bad. Let's have a look at the attributes now. So we have this CV and we know that uh, it was, I think the second one. Yes, that's the secondary payload. This secondary payload, uh, is trying to exploit the CV, so we could do something like this. Or we even have trying to exploit, and trying to obtain the exploit, not really the same. I will use exploit for that example. There we go, so we don't have anything not linked. So let's rearrange the graph a bit. Uh, so we have the person here, we have the file, the origin, the secondary file, the origin, the exploit, and then the exfiltration. So now I like how things are represented here. So what I can do is to save the current state of the graph so that next time when I want to view this graph, uh, it will be restored to that exact same state. So to do that, you click on history, then save, give a name, click on save, and that's it, that's saved. And now if I reload the page, I go back in even graph. You can see that it's not in the order where we set it, but if I click on history, and then on this small icon, I can restore the state of the graph, which is very convenient, especially when you have large graph. Um, that's not too bad. So we have the, the full story by just reading this graph. So we can see that it was person that sent the mail, that it was received from the location and that it did these actions. So now that we have all of this data, we could start adding context. Um, so let's, let's go check and see quickly what we have. Um, There's a question in the chat that may be important. Um, I don't know if it's just buggy, but holding shift doesn't let me drag an arrow. Is there another way? Uh, that's interesting. Um, 
so if you have it well if it doesn't work um if so, sorry just getting a bit of uh, oops sorry i was hearing a bit of echo so if if um if it doesn't work when the the canva is uh, is focused you can still click on this edit button so click on edit and then you can click on add reference and then it should work if it doesn't uh, let us know and possibly open an issue specifying the commit id and the browser you're using so that we can try to reproduce this you see uh, but to be honest it's the first time that i've heard about it and shift maybe it doesn't work but at least the edits it, it should it should absolutely work yeah, it's confirmed second option works oh. awesome thanks a lot uh, for the feedback uh, um okay so back to our event and back to to, our, to the context um so what do we know about the this event uh we could we know that it's currently being encoded um we could also specify uh, the distribution and or the releaseability to who this event uh, would be for. Um, so in our case, if you are familiar with the TLP protocol, I will not cover it uh, in, in depth, but basically this information is meant to protect our constituency only. So I would pick TLP Ember Obviously, it's up to discussion whether we would use TLP Ember or we would use TLP Green or even TLP White, depending on the instance, maybe. Uh, but I think TLP Ember is, uh, is well suited uh, for, for that event. Then we, we should describe what this event is about using tags so that we, if we want at some point to, to, to do some statistics or to aggregate data or to export anything related to phishing or spear phishing, it would be easy for us. So let's add information about that. So we have a taxonomy called phishing. And this one has a lot of uh, data available. So we have the different techniques of phishing uh the dis the different uh, uh distribution mechanism even the psychological accept acceptability so we'll pick some of them uh, so that we have something more or less complete so in our case this is email spoofing and this is peer phishing and psychological acceptability this is in person we know that there is impersonation with the teacher of the CEO doctor so we could say that it is medium to high uh, yeah, let's let's pick these ones. So email spoofing, spear phishing, and uh, let's take medium. We could even add action. So what should should be done on this phishing? Should we take down the, the domain? Or we could do also include information about the state. Is it active or is it an unknown or down? Uh, well, we'll not pick it, just take these tags. So now we have information about phishing. What do we also know? At the end of the mail, they ask the recipient, so the, the C cert, uh, that they would like to avoid informing the attacker that it was a failed spear phishing attempt. And they only ask, well, they ask us to only use the content information to protect the constituents. So we are not, we are ask not to perform active scanning on the attacker's infrastructure. And there is a specific taxonomy for that. This is the PEP taxonomy. So if you don't know PEP, it's an awesome taxonomy, uh, similar a bit in, in, in the way TLP works with the different colors. Uh, but this one is not about with who you can share information with. It's about what can you do with this information. So in our case, uh, we'll take the PEP rate, which state that uh, events or data marked with the PEP red tag, uh, only non-detectable action can be performed on this data. So we'll use this one. Uh, yeah. And then 
if we want to go really crazy about it, we could even include information about the reliability of the source of this information and the credibility of the source. Uh, for that, we have a taxonomy called Admiralty Scale, uh, where you could say that the reliability of a source, uh, we could say that the, the organization that reported that to us is usually reliable, so we could include this information. For this is not used most of the time, but if you want to automate things or to perform life cycle, indicator life cycle management, this can be useful. All right, I think we are done with the tags and the taxonomies. Let's have a look now at the galaxies. So what additional context could we add to, to this event? Well, we could add the country uh, where this incident took place, the sector, uh, we know that uh, we are dealing with telecommunication and most importantly, uh, the Maitre attack technique that were used uh, during this incident. So let's start with the easiest one, the country. Uh, so I never know in which, <laughs> in which namespace it is located. So I just pick all namespace, but then I know that I'm dealing with the country. And then I know that we are dealing with Luxembourg. Then for the sector, I will take the sector galaxy cluster. And then this is about telecommunication. So I can start typing tel and then pick telecoms. Now for the Maitre attack patterns, uh, for those who don't know what that is, uh, this is basically uh, uh, enterprise. Uh, this is uh, the Maitre attack navigator. Uh, if, if you don't know uh, what Maitre attack is, I really advise you to, to have a look at it. Uh, I'm sure Alex will paste uh, uh, a link referencing the Maitre attack framework. Uh, but basically, they created these, uh, uh, th this matrix that, that shows a different step uh, that an attacker can take uh, when they are doing malicious activities. Uh, and this matrix, we also have it in MISP, uh, almost same uh, looking wise at least um, so let's add the different techniques that were used for that incident so we know that there were some spear phishing uh, uh, and phishing so that's already a good start so to to view this matrix you can either click on this button and then it will show the matrix then from from that matrix you can pick the different techniques that you want to be applied and then click submit and it will create uh well it, it will attach these tags uh to the event or if you prefer to just type things uh you can click on the button inside the button there uh, and then you can type so we are dealing with phishing uh yes this one uh, phishing with malicious attachment. This is a good one. Spear phishing with malicious attachment. This is exactly what this event uh, is about. Uh, and we could also take the spear phishing attachment. There we go. Then submit, and we have our techniques attached. Um, last but not least, we also know that uh, this uh, this. Uh, the secondary payload is also exfiltrating data to a secondary payload uh, to a secondary um, uh, C2 server. So we could also add data exfiltration, like automated exfiltration. Uh, but it would be even better to attach this automated exfiltration tag to the actual indicator that is do doing the exfiltration. So we can see that you can also attach tags and galaxies to attributes. So let's do it. So if I remember correctly, it was the, this is not malicious that was uh, exfiltrating data. So I can click on this small icon and then uh, exfiltration, eh, automated exfiltration, submit. And what I would like to do is also to tag these file ashes so that they are also uh, uh, marked with the automated exfiltration uh, tag. But instead of doing doing that 
uh, step for each of them. I can also select them, click on this small icon, and then submit, and it attach the tag automatically. So if you if you can specify on which attribute a specific tags or taxonomy should be attached to, uh, it's always better to do it. Okay. Um, just a small clarification following a question that we, we had and I uh, think the question was interesting. Uh, tags can be used for a lot of things. So tags or galaxies, because technically galaxies are tags. Um, tags can be used for manual contextualization. So things that an analyst have seen that is helping the contextualizations. But it could be used for automation too. So it's really it's really important that those can be used by human and it's machine readable too. So um, every time you add contextualizations, think that it will help maybe human that are uh, actually using the data, but it might um, help also systems. Because more you do tax, more you do contextualization, better you can filter all the information and, and better you can even um, uh, transfer the information to the proper pipelines, for example, or adjust a specific workflow. Um, so it's it's indeed important. Um, tax are, are there to support users, but um, uh, can use uh, any uh, uh, any machine readable data and so on. Uh, there is a question from Nick about which version of, of Mitre we are using. It's always the latest one. Um, so we uh, basically ingest the um, CTI repository from Mitre, uh, which is automatically converted to the Galaxy. So usually uh, when they publish it the next day, uh, it's uh, incorporated into the Galaxy. And if you update the Galaxy, you get the latest versions. Uh, so usually the latest version that, that is uh, run, uh, which is sometimes a challenge because um, Mitre, for example, updates uh, sometimes techniques, splits the techniques, merge different techniques and so on uh, with sub techniques is this has changed quite a lot um so it happens sometimes that we we have old event with for example i would say orphan galaxies uh from my trade because they don't use any more these techniques and they are not obviously updated so there's no kind of real history in the uh, my trade techniques um so we um, sometimes have older versions for older events but usually the latest one is, is used for the um uh, latest event yeah, something that I would like to add uh, to that. <clears throat> uh, even though we have the latest version of the Maitre uh, attack uh, techniques, um, we still need to update the Galaxy Matrix uh, representation because if you spot it in the attack navigator, you have possibility to have some sub techniques contained inside one techniques. Whereas in our current implementation, uh, <clears throat> You, you have the sub techniques there, uh, but they are not really shown. You have to 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 use this search box uh, instead, uh, because yeah, initially when we designed it, we didn't expect to have sub techniques, and to have to have it the way they represent it, we need to update the uh, the layout. So that's something that will come uh, hopefully sooner than later. But anyway, the the latest techniques are available, and you can use it to tag your event and attributes. Uh, <clears throat> all right, so I think that's pretty much it for the data and the contextualization. Um, now, what we can have a look at is the event report. So usually what you would do in that case is you would start to explain uh, using words uh, what this event is about inside a report. Uh, but the good thing is, uh, thanks to uh someone's question we already have uh, an event report that contains exactly what the description of this incident uh, so if we click on it uh, we immediately see what this is about uh, but something that is worth noting <clears throat> is that we have reference to some attributes uh, uh well, actually data that are stored inside the event and we could do also some improvement on how this report is formatted. So let's have a look at that. So if you click, if you click on this, you can click on edit report. And then you end up in this interface where you can uh, edit the, the, the report on the left side and see the, the result 
of the rendering of the of this report on the right side. So as we mentioned previously, this report supports uh, Markdown. So we can really uh, start to add some uh, uh, well, format to this report. So in our case, this is, uh, what was the name again? Mail received from season. So you could do stuff like that. This is too big, so I will remove one. You can add some bolding, you can add some, well, I guess you get it what you can do with it. Uh, but most importantly, you can also reference that data that is stored inside your event. So for example, this, instead of having like the raw text, you could instead have a reference to this actual uh, value. So to do that, you can reference attributes, objects, pictures, and context tags and galaxies. So in our case, I want to reference um, this attribute. And what for you? I can start typing the text, select it, and then we have the reference. So you can see now, instead of having the raw text, we have an actual reference uh, to data that was stored inside the event. So if I click on it, I can see the whole object and the attribute uh, that is contained inside this object. Uh, yeah, so I could do it also for this one. Uh, so in our case, this is an attribute. I can put the value up and I have the reference. Um, if I would like to reference the entire object inside of in, instead of the attribute, I could do it, absolutely. Um, so I will just keep it so that I put the correct object. Uh, so this time we are dealing with an object. Oops. And then I can pick the correct one. This is a domain IP 3 way provider. And then I can remove this. And now I have a reference to the actual object instead of uh, an attribute inside this object. Um, I could do the same for, uh, for example, the CV. Where is the CV? There we go. So I can reference this attribute and then the CV, there we go. And then if I'm happy with it, I can save it. And now whenever I'm browsing the event, if I click on this report, I have the automatic reference and I can click on it to see more information about it. Uh, so obviously if this object uh, uh, or if these attributes contain tags, you would see them also. Uh, now it was a bit, it's a bit annoying to do the replacement manually. So we created tools to help you for that. So if you go to menu, extract entities, and then manual extraction, uh, you wait a bit, and then it will propose you in the data replacement tab, uh, replacement that, uh, that are available. So for example, we have uh, John Do somewhere. Uh, so there with the email address, we can click on this one. And you can see that it picks up automatically the part in the report that should be replaced. Do it replace and save, and then it performs the replacement automatically, as you can see here. Uh, so what else do we have? So for example, HTTP, it's mentioned multiple times, but you don't want necessarily to replace everything. But these are tools that you can use uh, to, to quickly do the replacement. Uh, now we also have what we call context replacement. Instead of looking at the data itself, it's looking at the context, so the tags and so on, that are mentioned in the report, uh, but are not converted into uh, into tags or tags reference. Uh, so C2 is not really a tag from a taxonomy. Uh, so I will create a fake tag. So like. Oh, not a failed tag, actually, a TLP number one. There's a question from Alfredo. Um, or to bring up the tool for data replacement. Could you repeat yeah. this? I will do it again. So I added this TLP tag, TLP number, and then PAP red. Let's do it like that. I will save it. And now uh, what I could do is to, instead of specifying in text 
de tag, I could uh, do a tag reference by clicking there and then PAP red, and then it converts it automatically into a tag. Or I could use the replacement tool by going into menu, extract entities, manual extractions. And I think I forgot to save when I did the PAP red tag, so this is not going to work. <laughs> So let me let me try to reload quickly. There we go. So menu, extract entities, manual extraction, context replacement, and then you can see that it automatically detected the two tags. So I can replace TLP Ember and I can replace PP Red. And there we go, we have the replacement. And we, by clicking on these tags, you can have more information about it. This is especially useful when you are dealing with thread actors or my thread attack techniques. Um, last but not least about this uh, replacement tool is that it also acts like the free text, uh, free text import tool. So let's say that uh, we had an attribute that we did not encode into our event. So uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, IP address, I will save it. So we have something that looks like an attribute that could be encoded into our event as uh, as text contained in the report. If we go once again into a menu, extract entities, manual extraction, we will not have 8888 in the data replacement because this value doesn't exist in the event yet. But if we go in data extraction, it detected that something exists in the report, but it's not contained in the event. So if we click on it, we can perform an extraction and a save. And what this process will do, it will extract it, convert it into an attribute, save it into the event, and perform the replacement so that we have a reference to that attribute from the uh, event report. So if I click on this one, you can see that it uh, created uh, a reference, and if we go back to our event, and if I reload, we will see the newly created attribute. So what we could have done instead of uh, putting everything in the free text uh, extraction tool, we could have created a report, an event report, and then uh, started to extract data immediately from this view. So that's another way to do things. Um, all right, so that was for the event report. Now, another visualization tool that we have uh, is the event timeline. So uh, Alex mentioned the timeline already, uh, but it's just a way to quickly view uh, when things happen, basically. So when we encoded this event, we never specified uh, any date uh, whatsoever. Uh, but if you would have uh, set a first scene or last scene on the object or the attribute, uh, it would be immediately visible in this timeline. So right now you can see that these ele elements are placed uh, and uh, the time at which they are currently pointing to uh, is the time at which they were created. So you can see that it took me almost one hour to create these, uh, these few objects. Usually it's faster. Um, uh, but yeah, if if I were to specify a specific start time and end time, uh, I could I could have a, a proper visualization. So for example, for the domain IP, if I want to specify a first in last in, uh, I could do it from that uh, from that interface. So I could specify a date for first in and, uh, and a time for last uh, for first in, and I would. I could also specify a date for last and a time for last scene. Uh, that is valid for uh, object, but you can also do it for attributes. So for example, this one. You can also change the first scene and last scene date and time for this attribute. So you can, you can either do it manually, uh, or you can also do it with this widget by just dragging and dropping things around. So if I take domain IP, if I move it a bit, no, it doesn't have a red border. A red border indicates that it doesn't have 
first in or last in set. And so it defaults to the timestamp, to the creation timestamp. Uh, but now I have uh, first in set and I can drag it around. I can do it the same for this URL. And if I wanted to express the fact that this domain was first in at that time and last in at that time, I can also click on this small double arrow that sets a last in and I can extend uh, the duration for this one. And now I have a first in set, a last in set, and obviously I can also drag, drag it around. So it's a, it's, it's a nice tool to, to visualize things when you have first in and last in set. Usually you don't set it by hand because it's very cumbersome and annoying to do. So usually you use tools uh, that will feed data to your misinstant tools or script that will set these fields automatically for you so that whenever you're browsing your event, you can use the, the timeline and have an immediate view uh, of any time uh, uh, any time dependent things. Uh, if you want to hide objects that don't have a first in last in, just click on display and then check this box and it will just hide it and only reveal objects that have a first in or last in set. Um, that's not too bad. Uh, there is something that I wanted to show, but I we do have a correlation there. Ah, so. Uh, I just want to quickly go over correlation and how you can visualize them. So you can see that we have too many correlations for a lot of attributes. This is mainly because the event I just encoded is a typical event that we use in exercises and demo. Uh, and also other attendees also like to encode few attributes around. So it creates a lot of events with the same data. And so we have too many correlations. So you can also see that now MISP has a feature that uh, stop creating correlation if uh, uh, an attribute has too many of them. But we can see that we have one, this one, that correlates with uh, some, uh, but not too many. That's good because that just means that this attribute is not created every time this event is encoded. Uh, you can also see at the top that uh, we had some related event. Uh, and you can quickly pivot to see that they are all the, the same event. Uh, the, they are all about the, the same incident, the same example incident that we used. Uh, so if you want, you can pivot by just clicking on this, and then you will end up in uh, in the other event. And if I click, keep pivoting, you can see in the, this small pivot graph uh, that we are currently exploring the different uh, correlation that we found. I will go back to the first one and then clean the pivoting. Uh, you can also have a correlation graph view that will show all correlation uh, that are that exists for this event. So if you click on view correlation graph, uh, you will see all correlation. So you we have our event here, we have the URL. We have the attributes. So fortunately, it doesn't display the overcorrelating value. Otherwise, you would have a massive correlation graph. It only shows uh, attributes that are not overcorrelating. Uh, so we have our event, the object that contains the attribute that is actually correlating. Uh, you can see that it also has the tags. And we could pivot on these tags. So if you want to see all events that are tagged, let's take Lux Luxembourg. Yep. All events that are tagged with this galaxy, you can press X or click on this button and it will include all events that are tagged with this galaxy in this graph. So you can also pivot uh, 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 and view and view things in this graph. And it's also uh, the, the, the good time to emphasize that contextualization is extremely important, as you can see, because with that, uh, we could easily extract all events that are targeting a specific countries and then aggregate this data and perform statistics. For example, what are the most common techniques used to target the telecommunication sector in Luxembourg? That would be very valuable data that anyone that is uh, working as a uh, cybersecurity in cybersecurity in Luxembourg for the telecommunication, telecommunication sector would like to know. Um, all right, enough for correlation. I think that's uh not too bad 
Um, uh, I answered an interesting, interesting question, question regarding time uh, and uh, from Angsgar. Uh, regarding the uh, first scene, last scene, and so on, and the sightings, is it preferred to, to set the first scene and last scene uh, versus the sightings? Um, just regarding that, it's really it's different. So the first scene, last scene is really preferred when you are the creator of the object, you know the timestamp and so on. The sightings is more like when you have multiple sources that need to set a time that, is that when it has been seen, um, then you have multiple time, uh, the entries for this kind of entries. Uh, which we basically will apply for the decaying of indicators and so on, but I think we will not cover that, that case today. Um, I, I see that time is running, uh, so maybe we can um, close it now and just uh, start with some Q&A if you have any qu questions. Yeah. What I would like to do before we close this session is to really quickly go over the MIS module and the expansion. Yeah, yeah sure. sure. Um, and that one note about collaboration with proposals. So two minutes and then we can go in the Q&A uh, section. So uh, uh, I wanted to go over MIS module. So in MIS, we have uh, a system that we call enrichment system that allows you to enrich data that already exists in your instance. So you can see that for some attributes, we have a small magnifying glass next to them. Uh, same for, oh, where is it, the CV for this one. That means that uh, this is an attribute type that can be enriched using our enrichment system. Uh, so let's enrich this, uh, this CV and let's see what, what, what it does. So if I click on Add Enrichment, and then I can choose the CV Advanced. Uh, what it does is it uses this uh, CV number, query an additional service, uh, that contain all information about that specific CV, and then convert this information into a MISP object that we can save inside our event. If I click on Submit, um, the job has been queued. I can reload now. And we have our vulnerability object uh, that is pointing with a reference uh, to our vulnerability uh, attributes. So this is one thing. Uh, so miss, we are using behind the scene miss module to perform the enrichment. We have plenty of enrichment module available. We have one uh, to resolve uh, localization. Uh, we have we have one to resolve DNS. Uh, as you can see by just hoovering this uh, attribute, you can also have a quick look. Uh, we have plenty of modules. We'll go through how you can set things up in the administration part of the training. I think it's tomorrow. Uh, but yeah, that was just to, to give you uh, a quick overview of uh, what it does. So when you over an attribute, it shows you information that are computed or that are retrieved on the fly. Uh, but if you create data from an enrichment, it persists this data inside your database. So for the vulnerability object data created, this one is saved inside the event, so it's stored in the database. So that was for uh, enrichment. Now, uh, for um, the collaboration aspect, uh, right now I'm currently editing an event, but I'm also a site admin, meaning that I've, I'm basically God on this instance. I have the permission to do whatever I want. Uh, that's why I have uh, some functionalities that usually standard users don't have. Uh, one of which is uh, the ability to create proposals. Uh, proposals are basically a proposition that a user that didn't create the event can do to propose a suggestion to the original creator of the event uh, to change a value or anything related to an attribute. For example, we created this event as the training organization. If Circle, uh, if the Circle organization want to propose a change to this event. So for example, if there is a typo somewhere, uh, they can do it by creating a proposal. So as an example, let's say that we notice that there is a typo on the .com. It's not .com, it's .net. What we can do is to click on uh, create a propose edit, change the com into net, click on propose, 
and then the original creator of this event will receive a notification that a proposal was created. He can then review this proposal, see the, the, the difference, and then choose to either accept it or discard it. If he chooses to accept it, the value will be replaced. Uh, and that's basically it. Uh, so that's it for the collaboration aspect. Uh, we will probably see more in the building communities section that we are going to present tomorrow. Uh, or the day after. I don't remember exactly the I need to check the agenda. Uh, but well, if you if you want us to expand more on all of this collaboration aspect, let us know. Uh, and we can squeeze things uh, in the agenda. Um, and I think that's pretty much it. Uh, so if you have any question about anything, uh, it's basically open bar right now. So feel free to ask, feel free to take the, the, the floor and ask the question using uh, the, the voice chat. Uh, and what I propose is that we also stop the recording so that these questions are not uh, uh, saved. So I will stop the recording right now. So for those that are watching uh, the replay, thanks for watching. <laughs> uh...